Okay, and welcome to the March webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month we feature Michael Zelensky with our webinar, who's going to take us on a tour of NASA's collection of materials that they have from space. But first, here's Vivian White with an activity you can engage your audiences in astro materials. Hi, everybody. I know a lot of you out there have meteorite collections, and one of our toolkits that we have through the NASA Night Sky Network is called Space Rocks. And in that is a really fun activity that's super easy to facilitate called Meteorite or Meteor Wrong. We got this uh, originally from Chabot Space and Science Center, and we've made it compact so you can take it with you, put it in your telescope case. You can make one of these on your own um, or make sure you get a Space Rocks toolkit. So I'm going to tip my um, screen down just a little bit so you can see this camera. This is a, a flip book that comes with it and it's appropriately called Meteorite Meteor Wrong. It also comes with lots of different rocks including a few space rocks and um, as well as a tektite. Uh, it comes with a magnet and a magnifying glass which are both very useful when looking for meteorites. So it starts off and it says, it's got three different sections here. One of them says, not sure about these rocks. And you put all the rocks in there in the beginning. And then you have one section up here that says, I think these are earth rocks. And these, I think over in this section are gonna be meteorites. So this flip book is really easy. We have um, a lot of Girl Scouts who really love doing this activity because you don't have to know much to begin with and you get the hang of it quite quickly. So while on this side, it talks to the public about what you were going to talk about, on the flip side, it gives a little bit of a script here for the presenter. So the presenter goes ahead and flips it over and uh, it gives you different clues that tell you uh, how to identify a meteorite. So it talks about they need to be light in color. They need to be, I'm uh, sorry, they cannot be light in color. Anything that's light in color, like this one will go and be an earth rock. Anything that's lightweight will also probably be an earth rock. Um, so the, your participants go through and feel these different rocks and look at them and examine them, see what they look like, and um, eventually use the magnet to detect some of these. It's a fun activity that's very, very easy to facilitate, and it goes through um, quite a bit of information about rocks, include, uh, about space rocks and meteorites, including what they look like and how to find them. And, and actually how difficult it is also to find them. So it, it talks in the end about, well, it's, you're not gonna wanna go into a stream to find these um, meteorites uh, and talks about where many of the meteorites are found, which I'm sure will be covered this evening. So uh, that's it, you can find it. Uh, Dave will put a link to that hopefully in the uh, chat and you'll find it if you're listening to this recording after the fact in the information below. So enjoy the webinar, I'm looking forward to it. All right, thank you, Vivian. Okay, so now for our featured program. Michael Zelensky works on understanding how asteroids have undergone chemical weathering, as well as the mineral composition of comets. He's currently leading efforts to locate and characterize fluid inclusions in astro materials, kind of an important thing to find out where, uh, what kind of fluids might be out there in space. He's led or participated in successful meteorite recovery expeditions on four continents and developed techniques for characterizing the meteoroid and space debris impact features on spacecraft. Dr. Zelensky has also led the effort to characterize the impact record of the long duration exposure facility satellite and develop new techniques for the analysis of microparticles. He led the sample analysis teams for the Stardust Comet Material Return Mission and the Hayabusa Asteroid Sample Return Mission. He is now on the Hayabusa 2 Mission Science Team, which is developing the next generation of astro material sample handling and analysis protocols. So please welcome Michael Zelensky. Uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, we can. Great. So first of all, I apologize. I'm getting over a cold. So if I start coughing like crazy, please forgive me. Um, so I work at Johnson Space Center in Houston. I've been here for a really long time. Uh, I originally came from upstate New York a long, long time ago. And I always wanted to be a geologist and study rocks out in the desert. And it never really happened. Instead, I became kind of a space geologist uh, looking at samples of asteroids and comets and, and getting those for the lab. And so we'll just click ahead here. You want to tell them about that picture? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, go ahead. Okay. 
So uh, quickly, um, this, this talk is very broad, and so if I uh, go over things you know very, very well, I apologize ahead of time, but uh, you know, every astronomical talk I've been to shows a picture of the solar system like this. Of course, this isn't what you'd actually see if you were out in space looking back at the planets. This is what you'd see. This is actually a mosaic uh, taken of the solar system by the Voyager 2 spacecraft after, after it passed by Neptune, gosh, like 20 years ago, and Carl Sagan when it passed Neptune, Carl Sagan said, why don't you turn the spacecraft around and take some pictures of the solar system? And it did, and it got this amazing, it's actually a uh, mosaic of images, and you can see the sun in a little box there, and you can see the giant planets uh, around it. At this scale, you really can't see the terrestrial planets at all. If you zoom in closer, uh, then you can see, uh, here's the sun, obviously, and uh, Mars wasn't visible, but you see Venus and you see uh, the Earth. Uh, and so the Earth's right here. And so in this, in this image, uh, and this is Jupiter, in this image, the Earth is only one pixel. In fact, Carl Sagan called it a, a pale blue dot. So uh, to give you an idea that when we're talking about going out in space and sampling space rocks or asteroids or comets, you know, most of what's out there is pretty empty. And the average uh, density of, uh, of space is about one grain of dust per cubic kilometer. So it's pretty empty. Um, but still very, very exciting. Uh, I'll press ahead here. So I want to talk about uh, missions that return uh, samples from asteroids and comets kind of recently. But I'll step back. Um, the building we're sitting in was built to uh, house the rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts, you know, exactly 50 years ago. And yes, they really did go to the moon. It wasn't faked by NASA. The rocks weren't actually created in laboratories in Arizona. Um, the rocks really did come from the moon, a bunch of sites here. And the U.S. and also the Soviet Union had several sample return missions from the moon. And those samples are uh, brought back by, by humans, uh, all men, unfortunately, and also by robots. Um, and here's Dave Scott walking around on the Apollo 15 mission, uh, taking a photograph. Um, and uh, these astronauts are now getting pretty gold now and kind of passing away. But fortunately, the rocks they brought back uh, will be on the Earth, uh, hopefully forever. Uh, they're a resource for continuing generations. When these missions were flying, I was in grade school, basically. And here I am 50 years later uh, in the lab where these samples were stored. And the samples, are, I mean, the samples have not been looked at in 50 years. In fact, they're about to open some lunar samples that have been sealed on the moon and not opened until this year. And so the idea is that uh, we, we recover samples, as cleanly as we can from known locations, bring them back to Earth, make them available for analysis by scientists on the Earth. Not only that, we also tuck a lot of them away, keep them as clean as we can so that the grandchildren of those first scientists can study these samples now. And so we're, we're, we're hosting uh, scientists now who were children when the samples were collected or not even born yet. And the goal is to keep these samples for hundreds of years even further on as a resource for, for the future. So the samples are all kept in, in vaults in this building. Not all the vaults are as serious as this one, which is the lunar vault, but they're all kept uh, behind uh, guarded locked doors. And that's mainly to protect the samples from getting uh, uh, altered by interactions with the atmosphere or people. Um, <clears throat> so I'll skip ahead again here. Uh, so 50 years ago, we were collecting uh, rocks on the moon and brought them back. And so this building was, uh, was built to house the geologists who were training the Apollo astronauts, but also to uh, build laboratories to care for those Apollo samples. But in 50 years since then, we've acquired many new samples of, of rocks from the uh, various places in the solar system, uh, starting with the asteroid belt. Um, and you all know where the asteroid belt is. I'll to show you, you're all astronomers. Uh, uh, most of them are, are between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, as shown on this uh, plot here. But of course, they're really all through the solar system. And there are asteroids that orbit in entirely within the orbit of Mercury, for example. And there are asteroids out there following the giant planets around as well. And you know, sometimes we have to go out and get asteroiding spacecraft, but, but often we can just kind of wait for the, for the uh, asteroids to come to us. This is what happened on February 15th, 2013, I can't believe it's already six years ago. Uh, it's amazing. There was a huge fireball uh, over Siberia. Uh, and here's a view here. And this is taken from uh, uh, near the city of Chelyabinsk. 
and uh, this bright fireball. Actually, the locals thought you might think that the average Russian might believe they're being attacked by American ICBMs, but actually, the average Russian at the time I was told believed this was actually an exploding nuclear uh, weapons dump. Because uh, that actually happened uh, it's like 40, 50 years ago. They have a nuclear weapons dump near Chelyabinsk. They exploded, and they had something like this happen then. So a lot of the locals thought, oh, it's happened again. They didn't first think it's an asteroid, but it was. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead. Okay. What, entered, what happened was uh, an object about 17 meters in diameter entered the atmosphere, uh, 40,000 miles per hour, about 10,000 tons of rock. Uh, and of course, it broke up, as most of these do, th thankfully. Uh, here's a view looking out of a truck driving, and if you, if you can understand Russian, he's going to be cursing in Russian in a minute, so I apologize for that. But to see this bright object hanging right towards you, uh, he got pretty scared. Uh, the amazing thing was that uh, several thousand, until this day, as far as you know, no more than one person at a time ever been injured seriously by a falling meteorite. But on this day, more than 2,000 people were sent to hospitals uh, from this, uh, this fall. So these are unfortunate guys, but they were not, uh, they were more than 2,000 people seriously injured, mostly by broken glass in the city of Chelyabinsk. So, so this, okay. So here's a little piece. So this was winter times, this is February in, uh, and here's a little piece of the meteorite that fell. It was an ordinary chondrite meteorite, a very common kind of meteorite. Uh, and it fell in the snow. People recovered thousands of pieces of this meteorite. And you can buy them on eBay very easily right now. Uh, the largest piece, uh, there's a, a left side is a view looking down at a lake. Some people were on the lake. And this is a hole made in the lake by the largest piece entering the lake uh, through this ice. And about a year later, they found the piece sitting on the ground uh, in the bottom of the lake. A diver brought it up. It isn't as big as this hole is, but several feet across, and it's now in the museum. So it went from, like I said, several, ten, about, about, two, about 20 meters in diameter to about one meter being the largest recovered piece. So, uh, you know, the U.S. was thinking about doing a mission to an asteroid, an Earth-crossing asteroid, uh, grabbing a sample of it, bringing it back to see what it was like. That would have cost billions of dollars. Then it happened for free, like that same year. So, uh, you know, sometimes the rights come to you. So again, you can wait for the meteorites to come to you, or you can go looking for them. That's something else we do every year. And you can do that too. Uh, for example, in Texas, if you go out to West Texas, you walk around dry lake beds, you can find meteorites, as most of you know. Uh, this is a place, this is the Namib Desert. I was there in 1990. Uh, we walked around for several weeks, and we found meteorites. I mean, you almost can't avoid finding them out there. But the best place to find meteorites on the Earth is, is in uh, the cold desert of Antarctica, this is a really old satellite view of Antarctica. Um, and basically the meteorites fall all across the earth at equal frequency pretty much. And for the most part when they fall, they land in the ocean or lakes or, or someone's backyard or the top of your house or you know, a stream and no one ever finds them and they fall apart. They rust and they're gone. But in, in hot deserts, especially in cold deserts where there's limited water, meteorites can fall and they can persist for millions of years. In Antarctica, there are meteorites been found that have been on the Earth for more than four million years. And in Antarctica, they just gradually move uh, on the ice sheets as they, as they uh, slowly move towards the edge of the continent along this cursor here and drop in the ocean. Unless they're carried on an ice sheet that hits a barrier range of mountains, like the Transantarctic Mountains right here. And then as the ice stalls behind uh, mountains projecting up through the ice, uh, the winds, the Katabatic Antarctic winds, sweep across the ice, uh, cause the ice to evaporate, and then the meteorites then reemerge from, from the snow and ice and just start sit there as uh, on top of the ice, easy to pick up. Uh, and here's a view of blue ice that's been stranded behind some mountains in Antarctica. So every year, uh, people uh, fly down to Antarctica or take a boat down there and spend some time uh, walking or snowmobiling across the ice looking for meteorites. And uh, more than 13,000 meteorites have been found in Antarctica in the past 50 years. Um, so when I went down there a couple of times, we flew down in C-130 planes, landed on the ice. You go into the field then, uh, 
in a small uh, twin otter or helicopters. Uh, the view on the right shows the plush accommodations in the C-130 as you're flying down to Antarctica. It's about a seven hour flight from New Zealand. Uh, it's not the most fun flight, but it's really fun landing in Antarctica. Uh, here's a view of McMurdo Station, the largest city as, as it is in Antarctica on the edge of the continent. And this little down here on the left, this is actually um, one of uh, Robert Falcon Scott's huts that's still there, preserved as a, as a uh, landmark site. Is there dead seals there and everything else outside of it? Um, but to go, then you go into the field, looking for meteorites, you go in the field in another C-130, uh, or maybe on a helicopter. Uh, you move around using these snowmobiles. You live in Scott tents. Uh, this is a two-person tent. It's about six feet across. Maybe there for six or seven weeks. Uh, living on the ice. And if you look around, you can see the bathroom. This is the bathroom. Once you're outside the tent, you're in the bathroom, basically. Uh, so you wonder what it's like uh, going to the bathroom in Antarctica. Uh, it's, it's not that much fun, but you get used to it. Uh, I'll say that. But most people go down, they really love it because they really uh, like being in an unusual place and being able to collect meteorites. Uh, this, uh, some days are very windy like this, in which case uh, you feel kind of stranded. Uh, near the nearest towns, maybe hundreds of kilometers away. But most days are like this, really beautiful. It looks like your uh, these snowmobiles are, are on water, but it's just blue ice, just a really beautiful day. These mountains in the background are several thousand feet high. Um, and you find this, here's a meteorite sitting on the ice. Uh, it's really fun to find meteorites, and you could, you could find, in a field season, maybe 2,000 meteorites down there. So uh, that's definitely a place to go for meteorites. And the cool thing is, you might think, gee, if we have 13,000 meteorites, you know, why bother finding another 200? But the fact is that uh, every year they find new and unusual kinds of meteorites from different asteroids that have never been sampled before. So every year we go down there, it's like a new spacecraft mission to a new asteroid. Uh, to come back to Houston, uh, just across the hall from where we are right now, Meteorites are stored uh, first in freezers, then they're slowly thawed out in nitrogen gas and then stored, and then sampled and analyzed, and then the uh, results are published in catalogs. Any scientist can request them. Uh, we have meteorites from Mars already. You don't have to send a spacecraft to Mars to get samples. We already have like something like 60 meteorites from there already. Um, of course, you want to get samples from known, well-characterized places. But we have some idea of what it's like already from, from these meteorites, many of which have been found in Antarctica. And we have meteorites also from the moon. Uh, we wouldn't have recognized these if we hadn't brought samples back from the moon, but because we did that, uh, we recognize them very easily. The Martian rocks recognize pretty much only because this is a Martian rock here. Uh, this one contains these areas of black glass that I'm looking at with a cursor. Those are places where the impact that knocked their rocks off of Mars partially melted the rock. And when they melted the rock, they, they squeezed some of the atmosphere of Mars into that melt. So when that freeze, when it froze to glass, the glass trapped the atmosphere of Mars. And fortunately, the Viking spacecraft were the first spacecraft back in the 70s who sniffed the atmosphere of Mars and analyzed it. And the scientists actually in this building first melted these bits of glass in the lab and then sucked out the gas, analyzed it, and found that it was an identical match to what the Viking spacecraft has found in the Martian atmosphere. So this was proof these rocks really were from Mars. We haven't yet found any meteorites from Venus or Mercury or, or the moon, or, or rather from, uh, from the Earth yet, but probably those are around uh, to be found. You keep hoping. Um, so uh, we found that uh, meteorites are really important. They tell us a lot about the asteroids and how planets form. I think you know about that already, pretty much. I'll just say briefly that, you know, the interest in asteroids Partly it's, it's because they're kind of a threat to us, right? We're worried about an impact of an asteroid. Uh, you want to know how to characterize them, what the properties are like, so that if you have to destroy one in the future, you might have an idea of how to do that. But for the scientists, the real interest is that they tell us about other environments in the early solar system. And a lot of them record the first stages of planet formation. They're kind of plants that never quite made it, but they record a lot of the early stages of planet aggregation and formation and that, that history is locked in. And so looking at many meteorites, you can look at different stages of how, say, the Earth formed or the Moon formed. And as I said already, they're also a threat to civilization. Um, 
as you know, but if you've been to any crater, if you see any meteoric crater, there are several meteoric craters in Texas. I was at actually one last weekend. Uh, this is the one in Arizona, which is probably the best preserved one on Earth. Um, but there's, there's uh, many of these on the Earth uh, to remind us that, uh, you know, we're all part of the solar system. Occasionally, uh, you know, things happen that are maybe kind of bad. Here's two scars of two impacts in Canada. Each of those are the size of the city of Tokyo. They're quite large. And those are probably from cometary impacts. And comets are maybe a more awesome threat than asteroids because asteroids have a chance of uh, characterizing where they are, their orbits, years ahead of time, and then figuring out if you're going to hit the Earth in the future, I mean, take some action against that, all right? For comets, the long period comets, they might appear just a few months before they hit the Earth, giving us very little warning of what's going to happen. So the comets, are, even if they're traveling faster than the asteroids, potentially larger in some cases, are perhaps a bigger threat than the asteroids are. Um, so with that in mind, we had a mission that launched uh, 20 years ago, in 1999, to visit a comet and bring samples back called the Stardust Mission. Um, and the Stardust Mission, we only had $200 million to do this mission, which seems like a lot of money, right? But in fact, that's about half of what a shuttle launch cost um, that isn't that much money. And so for that much money, all we could afford to do was to sort of fly by the comet coma, the atmosphere of the comet, open up a uh, tray of some collector material, try to catch some dust from the coma, and bring it back to Earth. And that worked. It was amazing. Um, and we used this tray here, uh, shown here being loaded into the spacecraft before launch. And this was a silica aerogel. It's the lightest material known to people, right? Uh, you can make it in the lab. You can, you can make it. People have made it for high school projects, actually, in their kitchen. Uh, and the thing here is it's very, very light, very transparent, and you can capture uh, very fast-moving grains of comet, comet dust and, and bring them back. And that's what we did. Launched uh, 20 years ago. I can't believe it. It was 20 years ago. Um, uh, right, okay. Uh, this is a little diagram showing you the orbit uh, of... of uh, Let's see, the Earth's orbit is this little inner white circle. The sun's here in the center. Um, here's Saturn's orbit, Jupiter, I'm sorry, Uranus's orbit, Uranus's orbit. Is that Uranus? Yeah, that's right, Jupiter's here, that's right. Uh, so, uh, the comet, Bill 2 was a comet we visited in the spacecraft, and it has the orbit shown in red here. So it travels out to where Jupiter is, and then comes in pretty close to the Earth's orbit, making it uh, a good candidate for a mission to return samples. Um, it turns out that by calculating the orbit back in time, scientists found that before 1974, which is the year I graduated from high school, uh, the comet had this orbit along this yellow circle, the yellow ellipse, took, took it out beyond the giant planets. And it had a close approach to Jupiter in that year, which swung it into this new red orbit. So we figured since it's a kind of freshly in the inner solar system, it might be an especially dusty comet uh, and very primitive. And those proved to be incorrect. Uh, here's a little cartoon showing the spacecraft. Uh, solar panels, Comet Vil 2 is about to pass it. This is January 2nd, 2004. It's a long time ago now. Uh, this capsule is opened up on the left here, and the tray of air gel has, looks like a tennis racket, has uh, extended up uh, above the solar, above these little protectors here, these little shields to protect the spacecraft from the comet dust. Because the comet is passing by the spacecraft with a relative velocity of six kilometers per second. So it's the grains of dust smacking into the spacecraft from the comet are hitting it about twice as fast as a bullet from a rifle travels. So the trick here was to design some material, we use silica air gel, to capture the dust grains uh, without destroying the spacecraft, without destroying the dust grains, or without destroying the capture cells. And uh, it all worked, it's amazing the first time we tried it. But it isn't always the case with spacecraft, as you may know. So this worked. Uh, these are little views of the comet nucleus as we pass by it. Covered with craters, that was a big surprise. Still quite understand that. It's kind of shaped like a, like a hamburger with a bite taken out of it. Um, and you can see in this image, this is a composite of images of the atmosphere. You can see dust coma trails coming out of the dust jets coming out of the comet and nucleus here. It's only about seven kilometers across. That's a, a medium-sized comet nucleus. Um, you know, comets are the biggest things in the solar system. Their, their, their comas and tails are millions of kilometers long, but the nuclei are quite small. Um, so we passed through three of these jets during the time we were opening 
the air gel and collecting dust. So we brought back to the Earth uh, thousands of, of coma grains from this comet from three jets. This is a view showing the spacecraft bearing the atmosphere over uh, central Utah, uh, 2006. And here's the capsule back on the ground. And in the lab, we'll bring you up, this is across the hall. This is a uh, really exciting time, it's about 10 p.m. at night. Uh, really tired, opening up the, uh, the capsule, looking at the air gel for the first time. And you can see impacts from the comet. These cells are about the size of ice cubes, uh, at like 7-Eleven uh, or Bucky's, right? And these are impacts from rather large comet grains. Most of the impacts are like here and here, very tiny little millimeter-sized trails of dust grains entering the air gel. We had, we had about 15 really big ones like this. Um, and this shows a view of a piece of the air gel pulled out of the tray. And here's an impact uh, in, uh, you can see a profile. This is a, the grain entered from the top, smashed into the air gel here, made this bulb-shaped track. Uh, and then grains ejected, oh, I'm sorry, can I go back? Yep. Uh, grains flew out of that and were captured in the air gel along the wall of the track. And then also some grains passed down and were uh, recovered from the very base of these uh, little tracks. So we have uh, hundreds of these, of these uh, impacts and thousands of comet coma grains. Uh, so basically in the lab across the hall here, the trick is to go in, identify these, these tracks, extract the tracks from the air gel, and make them available for analysis by scientists anywhere, really. Um, so show some more tracks. This is a pair of tracks, and you see a loop of the grain here captured at the end. To give you an idea how large these tracks are, a human hair would be the same size, uh, same diameter as this track right here. So these are human hair diameter tracks. These tracks are even thinner, and the grains captured here are in the order of a few to a few tens of microns in diameter. They're really tiny, but these days we can do a whole lot with grains that small. We have exciting people visit the lab, uh, like my daughter here, came over with her friend when she was six. Here's Stephen Hawking, who was here uh, years ago. Um, that was very exciting. So I'll move on now to discuss the Genesis spacecraft, which returned uh, dust from, actually dust, atoms from the sun, um, the solar wind, uh, it paddled out, went into uh, an Earth-Sun Earth, uh, Lagrangian point, and then soaked up uh, rays for several years in these, uh, they had a rays of, looks like a watch unfolding here. They had a rays of different types of materials, and mostly, mostly silica wafers, but also gold and sapphire, all kinds of other things, capturing atoms into the solar wind. And the goal here is to find out what the bulk composition of the sun is. It really isn't very well known at all. Uh, I'll, I'll go on now. Those, those samples are also here in the building. Um, uh, mission I worked on, Mission to Stardust, was the Hayabusa mission. This is a mission <coughs> that's primarily a Japanese mission, and JAXA is the Japanese space agency. By the way, JAXA is Japanese for weak man, so maybe it's, it's ill named for a space agency. Um, there's a cartoon showing the spacecraft. Uh, this was two, see, 2000 and uh, launched in 2004. In 2008, it got to the asteroid Itokawa. It's shown here on the right, shaped kind of like an otter. Uh, this asteroid is less than a kilometer in diameter. It's really tiny, very rocky, as you can see, and the spacecraft did some touch and goes on the surface, and the goal was to do a touch and go. This little elephant foot here sticking out that would uh, pound into the surface. It fired a little gun, uh, and then dust would rise up and be captured by the spacecraft. And it turns out the gun never fired. They, they landed three times, it never fired, but just because the grains on the surface are so charged up by the solar wind, uh, all kinds of grains just were stuck in the spacecraft by static charge. So thousands of grains came back to the Earth anyway, even though the, the collection mechanism didn't really work properly. So it's an amazing uh, uh, spacecraft. It didn't work as it was supposed to work, but still returned samples to the Earth like it was supposed to. That happened in 2010. I can't believe it's nine years ago already. Uh, it's hard to believe. So those samples uh, are mostly in Tokyo. You can visit them if you like. But about 10th of them are here uh, downstairs, actually, in our building, um, because the U.S., uh, NASA rendered some assistance on this mission. Um, the U.S. got 10% of those samples. So those samples were the first samples 
we ever return from a known asteroid. And that was very exciting because if you're an astronomer, people look at asteroids from the Earth using telescopes. You look at reflected light from those spacecraft. You measure the spectrum from, from the telescopes. You measure the, the uh, spectroscopy of the reflected light. And you'd think you could compare that to, to measurements, similar measurements of meteorites in the lab and then, and then uh, match the meteorites in the lab to their parent asteroids. But it turns out it doesn't work. Uh, the, the meteorites are somehow changed. Um, the asteroid surfaces are somehow not exactly like the meteorites. Uh, we suspect it has to do with the processing by solar wind smacking into the surface and other processes. We didn't know for sure until we returned samples from this known asteroid, which we then could compare directly on the ground to meteorites. And then we realized, okay, here's, here's the, the processes that affected these little grains. It was solar wind, in fact. And here's how it changed the surface. And that enables us, like Rosetta Stone, then to read the mineralogy of all kinds of other asteroids. Now that we know uh, what effects to, to understand, to uh, kind of transfer the knowledge of spectroscopy of meteorites to spectroscopy of asteroids. So this is a really important mission, even though it only returned it was less than a milligram of dust. So that was a really important mission. So happening right now as we speak, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is at the asteroid Ryugu. If you're watching the news, two weeks ago it did its first sampling on the asteroid. Uh, asteroid Ryugu is thought to be a carbon water rich object, uh, perhaps similar to, to the objects that would have brought raw materials of the oceans and life to the Earth. So there's a lot of interest in, in the samples from this spacecraft. Um, there's a cartoon on the left here. The asteroid's shaped like a diamond. It's kind of cool. So basically it's shaped like this because uh, it was once part of a much larger asteroid. It was uh, just aggregated by a little bit large impact. Some small fraction of that re-aggregated into another secondary body, which is why it's so rocky looking, and it's spinning faster and faster while Europe spin up. Uh, process which causes asteroids to spin faster and faster, which causes uh, them to achieve, to kind of have these diamond shapes with uh, the equatorial uh, area is bulging out because the material is moving towards the equator as it spins faster and faster. They spin fast enough, they just fly apart. So these asteroids are spinning up uh, due to um, interactions with, with the solar radiation, actually. So here's a movie, I hope, should play, let's see. Let's see. Um, no. All right, yes, playing. This is a movie, uh, the foot of the collector is right here. This is a spacecraft here, body. This is a shadow of the spacecraft on the surface. Getting closer and closer, now it dives down, touches the surface and fires a gun, and you'll see material rising off the surface as it's hit by the both the gun and also by uh, the jets the spacecraft fires to then to rise up again. Now it's, now it's hitting the surface, it fires the gun, and then rises up. And you see material scattered up all around the spacecraft. Uh, and they're hoping to get like 10 grams of dust. They probably got a lot more than that. And these big pieces here, some of these pieces are, are like 10 centimeters in size. And another movie, which is still secret, they haven't shown yet, uh, there are boulders as large as uh, 0.6 meters in diameter that are rising up towards the spacecraft uh, from this. So the spacecraft touching down on the surface caused this, this uh, kind of a uh, inverse landslide material up into space. Uh, and then now the worry is some of this material may have hit the spacecraft, may get damaged some things. I don't know, it's, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, it just happened two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and the spacecraft is now actually about to fire a gun uh, from space at the asteroid It's going to, um, to launch projectile, uh, then pass around behind the asteroid. Projectile then explodes and sends a large cannonball basically into the asteroid, makes a crater. The spacecraft will then come around and then try to sample the material that was exposed by that impact. And they'll do the they'll do this explosion event in April, and then they'll do they'll try to do the second sampling in mid June. That's the plan. It'll leave the asteroid in December of this year and return to Earth. Leave back on Earth two years from now. So we just had a meeting last week with the planetary science meeting to discuss results from planetary science. Two years from now, we'll be talking about analyses of the dust and, and rocks from this spacecraft. It's really exciting. So also, also happening now is the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. This is a billion dollar you know, mega mission that the NASA sent to the same thing, another water 
carbon-rich asteroid, Bennu, which, as you can see on the right, looks exactly like uh, Ryugu, uh, the, the uh, target of the Hayabusa 2 mission, only it's a lot smaller, it's a quarter of the size. So the spacecraft cost five times as much as Hayabusa 2, and it's going to an asteroid that's, that's one-fifth the size. That's, that's somehow that's, uh, that's uh, fair, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, right now this spacecraft, Osiris Rex, is orbiting this asteroid Bennu, and it'll, it'll do sampling, I think two years from now, it'll do its sampling missions and return to Earth in 2023. So it returns to Earth uh, three years after Hayabusa 2 does with uh, probably very similar samples. We don't know. Um, we'll find out. It's possible that one of these objects has been heated more than the other, which might give us a different sample returns from one versus the other. We just don't know. But these are both very, very exciting objects because they're based on spectroscopy, we know they can have a uh, water of hydration, clay minerals uh, on board, and they have organics as well. And so again, these may be surviving objects of the type that brought you know, raw materials for life and the oceans to Earth billions of years ago. Uh, that's why these missions are so exciting and going on. Also about to happen, um, the Jap JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, is going to send a mission to collect samples from the largest moon of Mars, Phobos. Uh, it's going to launch in five years. This is called the Mars Moon Exploration Mission, or MMX mission. They haven't announced it, but they're going to. And it'll launch uh, five years from now. And 10 years from now, it'll really have brought samples of Phobos back to Earth. Uh, pretty exciting working on this mission right now. This is a really exciting mission. So we've been wanting to do for, for generations. And there's a chance that Phobos has samples from Mars on the surface. You know, no one knows how Phobos formed. It may be a captured asteroid, uh, maybe the type that the uh, OSIRIS-REx and the two spacecraft are, are orbiting right now. Or it could be a piece of Mars um, tossed up by a big impact, a giant impact in its past. Or it could have formed in Mars form. No one really knows. Um, we'll find out in 10 years maybe less. So uh, the, the curious thing is because the, the samples could be anything from Mars type samples to water and organic which covers just chondrites, it's tricky to, to design the capture system and the containers to hold the samples because you kind of want to know if you have an organic forward sample, you might want to treat samples one way. If they're water and organic poor basalt samples like you'd see on Mars, you treat them a different way so it's a real challenge to design this mission. But uh, that's gonna happen, uh, it's happening right now. It's really exciting. And uh, so there are plans, if you heard today, there are plans to return uh, samples from the moon and Mars. Both the US, also India, uh, also China are planning sample return missions, both to the moon especially, but eventually to Mars. Um, you don't hear much about the Chinese Space Agency, perhaps, but they're also planning to do a, an asteroid sample return mission in the next decade as well. So this is really, I mean, you think of Apollo as being this great time in space exploration, but in fact, this is now the golden age of sample return missions for us. This is the best time to be a scientist studying rocks from the solar system, because samples are coming in all the time. It's just really great. So uh, if any of you are thought about being a planetary scientist, working on rocks or just studying these objects, this is the best time ever to be, to be doing that. And I think that's maybe all I have. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. And just to add, this is Paige, I'll say that we're lucky enough that in the building we're sitting in right now, we house these samples or percentages of the samples from the Japanese missions right here in this building and so mike gets up close and personal to these things probably a little bit more than than most all right well this is really fascinating and and the number the amount of material that's there is just kind of staggering in, in some ways so we do have some good questions here so let's uh, kind of get to these questions and um i'm going to defer one to uh, david here in just a little bit let's start with the uh, one from carol uh, she asks, why are there about an equal number of samples of uh, meteorites from Mars and the moon? Shouldn't there be more from the moon? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Nobody knows the answer. So uh, since the moon's a lot closer, when you have an impact that hits the moon and sends samples to the Earth, they probably arrive within a few years. 
Uh, whereas an impact on Mars might take thousands of years to get, for example, to get to the Earth. And so somehow uh, that's evening out. That's a really good question. There also haven't been, you know, there haven't been any observed falls of meteorites from the moon. They're all recovered masses just fell on the Earth. But there are plenty of observed falls from Mars. So uh, when Mars, when it gets hit, then the impacts on the Earth are spread over thousands of years. On the moon, they're over, it's over pretty fast. So uh, I suspect the moon being closer, it's just that we haven't had a big impact on the moon in a really long time, big enough to send samples to the Earth. Although we do see you know, grains in the atmosphere coming in from the moon sometimes. We just haven't seen the rocks. That's a really good question. And there are about, I think about 60 meteorites each from the moon and Mars recognized so far. If you think about uh, meteorite fall statistics, that means that a meteorite's falling from, from Mars about every day, actually. Uh, most of which, of course, are never recognized. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so we've got uh, two questions, one from Carol and Ron, and I'm gonna kind of combine these. Uh, Carol noted that uh, um, that about Stardust, Stardust was uh, um, not the one that, that crashed in right. the desert. Um, but then Ron kind of elaborates on this, and, and so they both kind of uh, asked the question is, were they able to get some samples from the Genesis mission that crashed in the desert, and what were the ultimate results of that? Yeah, so the goal of Genesis was to uh, capture atoms from the sun and analyze the bulk composition and isotopic composition of the sun. They were able to, they were able to do that. It took them about three times as long as they thought it would because they had to carefully pick up these tiny little pieces of broken solar cells, uh, put them together again. But because the atoms were embedded in the solar cells, once you remove the dirt and soil from Utah from those crash materials, you could then analyze, uh, sputter down, you know, mill down into the samples and analyze the solar atoms. It just took them a lot longer to do that. And fortunately also, the most important sample was this piece of gold that was kind of hanging in the center part of the spacecraft that somehow survived being destroyed. It was, it was kind of just slightly bent, but uh, miraculously that survived uh, almost intact. And so the most important science was, uh, came pretty, easy, pretty quickly. And uh, as a result, actually, they thought that some have a certain uh, oxygen isolate composition. People were totally wrong about that. Uh, and Stardust too, you know, before we had this mission, you know, we thought we knew what comet grain dust would be like based on analyses of meteorites and stratospheric dust. We were totally wrong. Uh, it's just great. And with the sun, same deal. I mean, people thought they knew what the bulk this would be like for the sun. And for the most part, they were totally wrong. And this makes these missions so exciting. All right. So always, uh, the, it's the surprising things that seem to push the boundaries of our knowledge, it seems, a lot of times. Um, Okay, Rosemary, I'm going to go to someone different here. So Rosemary asked, uh, why does the spacecraft that's orbiting Bennu, uh, why is it doing that for two years before taking the samples? Yeah, I'm not on that mission. Um, that's a really good question. I think just being very cautious. Like I said, you know, the high boost emissions cost and start us about $200 million each. They're kind of like, uh, like Viking missions. You're like swoop in and grab samples and get away, right? But Bennu, it's, it's really a... Uh, you know, like a, like a uh, uh, you know, it's a very expensive mission. A lot of effort went into, extra effort went into doing this. So we're being very, very careful to select a sampling site. And, and as, uh, as was the case for the Hibusa 2 mission, the, the asteroid they, they visited is a lot rockier than I thought it would be. And everyone thought these asteroids would have, uh, you know, a few areas of just dust where you could safely land and sample without worrying about crashing into something. But both these asteroids, Ryugu and Bennu, proven to be extremely rocky, extremely terrifying looking objects. And so it's, it's uh, caused the engineers to think really hard about, you know, revising for your plans for how you select a sampling site, how you go down and sample and get out of there. So I think they're, they're just being very, very careful to survey the entire asteroid, pick out the best possible place for sampling. So did they actually extend the mission a couple of years to account for this uh um, taking no, they, always had, they always had planned it for it to be this long. They just they had planned to do a lot more at the asteroid, characterize it much better. Okay. They, 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 you know, they always have the option of sampling whatever they want to sample. Maybe they move the sampling period out later. I'm not sure because it's such a, dairy, a hairy looking asteroid. Um, we'll see. 
they'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, Justin uh, asked a question here, and um, you know, as all of these missions, since they get funding from the government, they're all political in nature to some extent, but uh, any comments on the canceled asteroid redirect missions? Is this no longer a concern by the International Space Agencies? Yeah, the, the agencies are still concerned about Earth crossing asteroids and the hazard posed by those. And so they still have these plans to go to a couple of these uh, potentially hazardous Earth crossers, and Ben is one of them, by the way, um, and uh, either do a sample return or at least uh, try to figure out uh, how solid they are. Are they bean bags or are they solid objects? And how could you then prepare a defense against them? But the asteroid sample, uh, the asteroid redirect mission, they kept renaming it. That mission went away. Uh, uh, and uh, I think they decided the missions that are happening now, uh, Hybrid 2 and uh, Osiris Rex, would be able to, to answer many of the questions that they were trying to answer with that, that mission. And you know, the plan was to use astronauts to do part of that. And now they're being redirected back to the moon as of today. So the astronauts are, I'm sure, very happy to be going to the moon and seven asteroids. So I'm sure they're happy. All right. Let's see. Uh, Michael asked the question, have, um, have the results of the Hayabusa mission altered the classifications, and I'm not entirely sure what this is, but you probably do, of the HED definitions of VESTA, or are they holding with current data? Yeah, so the HED. Vesto Zandal was actually visited by the Dawn spacecraft, not Hibusa, Hibusa. And so the, the Hibusa mission went to an ordinary chondrite type parent body. So for Vesta, uh, the Dawn mission um, didn't return samples. It, 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 it orbited Vesta for, for quite a while. It didn't really change our understanding of the meteorites. We still think the meteorites, the HED stands for Howardites, Sucrites, Diogenite meteorites. I think those meteorites come from the asteroid Vesta. We still think that. So the spacecraft mission, the Dawn mission, didn't really change uh, our, our understanding of the meteorites that much. We still think they came from either a Vesta or a related asteroid. And we have those in our collection, is that correct? Yeah, correct? yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so here we have a question from Calvin, age eight. How many asteroids are there in the asteroid belt? Yeah, Al Kevin, actually, I was eight when I decided to be a geologist. So you're at just the right age to decide to be a planetary scientist. So stick with it. Um, good question. There are millions of asteroids. Um, you know, there are like 100,000 asteroids that have been discovered and sort of named and are tracked. Uh, that's down to like a meter in diameter. If you go to even smaller diameters, it depends on where you decide to stop calling it an asteroid and start calling it a micrometeoroid or something. So there are millions of them. And you might think that's a whole lot of mass, but of course, you put all the mass of all the asteroids together, it's much less than the mass of the moon. So it's not a destroyed planet, um, uh, per se. Uh, the cool thing about the asteroids is how variable they are. And just last week at this meeting we had in Houston, we were discussing, there's one type of meteorite called Uralites, which appear to come from a, 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 a small planet that was the process of totally melting and cooling like the early Earth would have done. And then it was blasted apart by an impact and then reaccreted. Uh, it's so cool. But this was a, uh, uh, so studying these realite meteorites tells us a lot about, you know, these initial stages of planet formation and, and, ge and geology. Um, so, you know, there are millions of, of asteroids. Um, I said we have something like 40,000 meteorites now in our collections. Those 40,000 meteorites come from probably 100 of those asteroids total. So we have a million asteroids, maybe only 100 of them sampled by meteorites. So we have a long way to go to understand the asteroid belt. What's the, um, you know, kind of a follow up to that? And so why is it that the vast majority of the samples are from a fairly small number of the asteroids? Yeah, you know, it, you might think that, gee, asteroids, they can hit all the time, they fall apart. The rocks go in all directions, they could hit the Earth all the time. But in fact, uh, most of the impacts on the asteroids was a long time ago. And uh, it's mostly pretty quiet out there, as a matter of fact. Um, and so the processes that bring rocks to the Earth today depend on giant planets kind of moving the asteroids around, uh, spinning them up. The Earth causing them to spin faster. The sun causing them to spin faster and faster and pieces coming off. 
And so there, there are processes that provide uh, meteorites to the Earth that mostly come from just a few places in the asteroid belt that are uh, especially affected by either the sun or the giant planets. And so most of our meteorites come from only a very few asteroids that happen to be in those places where it's easy to transport rocks to the Earth. Um, but having said that, it, it, dust size material comes from, does come from everywhere. So I also study uh, stratospheric dust coming in the atmosphere, and those dust grains can come from anywhere. And so there are scientists who study, so their whole career is studying microscopic dust grains from, from asteroids. And we're looking at samples from thousands of asteroids, but they're much harder to study. So, uh, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, Mike asks, and so now that you have these samples, what methods are you actually using to analyze the samples? Yeah, we use a hand lens and a magnet, mostly, just like in your meteorite kit, right? No, I'm kidding. So, uh, um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, a uh, every year it changes. I mean, we're using um, electron beam techniques, uh, electron microscopes to get a good view of the samples at high magnification, especially these comet grains and asteroid grains, which are microscopic to begin with. Um, you can look at the, the isotopic compositions using ion microprobes. You look at the organic compositions by all kinds of techniques. People, I had a postdoc who was studying uh, amino acids in meteorites. Uh, that's really cool. And it turns out that's, a, that's, that's really, really cool to think about that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a whole talk by itself. Um, I study food inclusions in meteorites. Some meteorites contain in mineral grains, droplets of water from the early solar system. And you can see these in, in a microscope. You can see the water droplets moving around in the sample um, and study the water from 4.5 billion years ago that's been preserved in, in uh, like little bottles in the, in the meteorites. So there's, uh, there's really hundreds of techniques for studying these meteorites. Every year there are new techniques that come along. Um, new scientists who were maybe studying you know, something over here, and it's the guy interested in meteorites and turned their technique to studying meteorites for the first time. That's great because I learned something new about these rocks. Um, I'll say one more thing. You know, there's a lab uh, uh, across the parking lot from us, uh, 70 feet down on the ground. And when the Apollo samples came back from the moon, they had this uh, detector, detector down there for analyzing the bulk composition. And to do this, you have to have detectors the size of a refrigerator. And you uh, had to have a sample of rock that was the size of your brain, right, to make this analysis. And now, 50 years later, you can do the same analysis on a grain that's a nanogram in mass and on a detector that's almost microscopic. So those are the advances you made in 50 years in sample analysis for samples. And the number of techniques you can use uh, is almost endless and growing all the time. Wow. So. Well, you have these samples there, and so John asked the question is, um, um, do you kind of store these asteroid return samples? Do you keep them in vacuum until they're opened, or what's the storage protocol for all these materials that you have from space? So um, Obviously, they're in a different environment now. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, they're captured in a vacuum environment, and you want to preserve them in as close to that environment as you can. It turns out it's really hard, expensive, and dangerous to study things in a vacuum. And you can store them in a vacuum, but it's kind of hard to, to handle them, break them, analyze them in a vacuum. So usually people use um, special environments, nitrogen cabinets with very, very dry nitrogen gas, pure nitrogen gas to, to uh, store the samples, to break them, and do some analyses. Um, some labs use argon gas. Some labs use helium. The, the, actually, the Russians put their initial lunar samples in helium. Uh, they thought that was a great idea. It was a real bad idea. Um, the U.S., when we first got samples back from the moon 50 years ago, we, we stored them in a vacuum. That was super dangerous and expensive, and now it's almost all stored in nitrogen gas. But the, the high booster samples in Japan, those are stored in a vacuum. Um, techniques have come along to where that's a doable thing now. So in the future, probably more samples will be stored in at cold temperatures and a vacuum uh, until they're needed for analysis. Okay. Well, we've got lots more questions here. I'm just going to go, you know, and, and try, try to protect your time. We're going to go for two more here. And so Joe asked the questions about uh, what you're looking for uh, when you look at this. He asked, do you look for signs of life 
or in the collection process, or are you more focused on the chemical <laughs> composition? Uh, it's both. So um, uh, mostly, my I'm a mineralogist, so mostly I'm interested in, in the minerals that are there, compositions of the minerals, what those tell us about how those minerals formed. But I had a postdoc who was looking at amino acids and organics in the same samples. So we worked, you know, worked side by side, the organic chemists with the inorganic chemists looking at these rocks uh, routinely. So when a meteorite, for example, a meteorite fell in Botswana last year, uh, 19, 2018 LA. Uh, it's the first, the second meteorite seen as an asteroid first, land on the earth as a meteorite. So right now we're in a lot of planning analyses of this, of this very special meteorite and they're organic chemists working side by side with inorganic chemists, with physicists, uh, with all kinds of people to plan, you know, what order you do analyses in to phase the analyses so each analysis doesn't wreck the analysis for the future for the subsequent analyses, what order to do them in to get the most from each sample. So we're really doing all of those things, including organic analyses, um, inorganic analyses, people looking uh, for new minerals. The biologists are looking for fossils. They haven't found any yet, but uh, they're looking for maybe the breakdown products from, from uh, biology. They haven't seen any yet. What we have seen, though, are the first steps towards life, things like uh, hollow uh, balls of a carbohydrate, of hydrocarbons. We see those very commonly. We see amino acids. We see uh, you know, all kinds of things, which you could think of as being like maybe in this first uh, uh, soup on the earth in which life emerged. All those raw materials are present in meteorites. Um, uh, yeah, so we're looking for everything all at once. It's really fun. Uh, Great. Okay, well, this will be our last question. And so uh, Ron asked a question. He, he notes that uh, once upon a time, he was able to visit the Lunar Receiving Lab uh, at Johnson Space Center. And he notes that he was understood that um, the Lunar Lab was going to close or did close. And if so, what's going to happen with the rocks from the new missions? And if it's open, you know, are you going to do anything different with the new samples to compared to what you've done in the past? So the Lunar Sample is still open. It's the next building over. Um, 